good afternoon let's continue from where we left off so this we introduced uh, a little bit of statistical mechanics we told you that this omega the number of uh, ways a particular microstate can be reached is essentially an important quantity and with that we can uh, basically derive the thermodynamics of the system and we showed that for our ideal gas right uh, like some of you have been uh, have already asked me last class what happens when you have uh, an interaction existing between the atoms okay so when the particles are going to interact then the uh, schrodinger wave equation becomes this so i think that should be a bracket uh, like that okay that becomes a schrodinger wave equation and when this potential energy is present, it becomes extremely difficult to solve the differential equation. Consequently, we have to resort to numerical techniques like density functional theory and others in order to solve these equations. Okay, that is a subject of a different, that's a different subject and that's not something that we can cover in class today. However, we don't but it's not necessary that we need to always solve the Schrodinger wave equation. At, at times, it's possible for us to actually resort to the classical um, viewpoint, uh, especially when we are not going to consider the, the contribution of electrons. Then it's okay if we actually um, not solve the Schrodinger wave equation, but instead take a classical uh, point of view. So, what does classical mean? Classical means we can actually solve Newton's equations in order to predict. The systems of behavior and not necessarily the Schrodinger wave equation. So, um, in Newton's equation of motion, all the atoms are basically so the, the manner in which it is done is as follows. So, you consider a system comprising of a large number of atoms, and each of these atoms are actually interacting with each other through some force field, so some through some potential, okay. And you can write down the equations of motion for each and every particle comprising the system and consequently when you solve the equations of motion you get the positions and the velocities of all the atoms comprising the system as a function of time okay so classical viewpoint solve Newton's equations of motion. That's it, right? So you have a large number of atoms and they're all interacting with each other through some springs, some nonlinear springs. Okay, we don't know what these, we, we don't know the functional form of these springs yet. They're all interacting with each other. And given some initial positions for all these atoms, some initial velocities for all these atoms, you can solve f equal to m a okay. and as a result of this you will get the positions, position vector and the velocity vector for all the atoms comprising of the system. The basic idea in classical statistical thermodynamics or classical uh, statistical mechanics is that All the properties, any property, any property say A of the system is actually a function of the momentum and the positions of the system. So I am intentionally using P and Q which are uh, which are always, always used whenever we talk about uh, classical systems. We don't really talk about velocities and positions, rather we talk about generalized momenta and generalized positions and we will see the, uh, we will, I will give you some examples as to why that is uh, usually powerful. Okay, so you, uh, for the time being you, you can view this as say uh, the velocity of the system of all the particles in the system and the positions of all the particles in the system. So I know the A, I know a functional form for this property A as a function of the velocity and the position 
of all the particles in the system, right? Consequently, it also is a function of time, which means I know it as a function of time because the positions and the velocity are now evolving as functions of time when we solve the equations of motion. So once I know this property A as a function of time, then I can calculate the time averaged property of the system using something like this. This is actually the time averaged property of the system. Infinite, a very large number. Infinite. Okay. Now, do you have any questions? Do you want to question this? What is now? That, 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 that is the first question I am expecting. What is this? What is infinity? What is delta t? Okay. Um, what is this property? What are these brackets? Time average, it's called time averaging, okay, or as we will see in a little bit, it's also called it can be can also be used to represent something called as the ensemble averaging. Okay. The whole the whole idea here is that when you are talking about a system in equilibrium, its temperature does not change. For example, if you have a system, the system that we saw, which was constraint L particles, volume B and energy E was held fixed for this particular system. What is its temperature? Is its temperature a constant? Yes. yes, 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 right. Sorry. I should have it. You should divide it by delta. So we are actually looking for this quantity. Okay, once you know this quantity, you know uh, what that. Uh, so so let me motivate this by looking at this uh, isolated system here. You have a large number of atoms, and they are constrained to be. It's an isolated system. Okay, it's, it's volume is constrained, the number of particles is constrained, and the energy is fixed. The macro state is fixed. Now the question that we ask is. What is the temperature of the system? Right. So the answer to that is if you actually take the temperature of the system and plot it as a function of time. It's going to be Looking something like this, it's going to be fluctuating about the value that it is going to have at equilibrium. It's not going to be a fixed number. It's going to be fluctuating about some value that it will have at equilibrium. Okay. And it so happens that these fluctuations or these vibrations, this time scale, okay, is 
is going to be in the order of what is the order of vibrations of atoms? What is the frequency? Maybe 10 to the power 12, 13 hertz. 10 to the power 30 hertz, where atoms are vibrating at very high frequency. So, the if you average this over even a reasonable time, say for example, in the order of few hundred picoseconds or a few thousand picoseconds, also it averages out and it gives you the equilibrium temperature that the system is going to have with very little error. Okay. So when you are putting a thermometer and trying to measure the uh, temperature of the system, the temperature that you are actually measuring is the value that it has averaged out over that over that small time over which you have fixed it. And because the these uh, vibrations or the uh, vibrations of the atoms happen at such high frequencies, the the value that you are reading off of it gives you the right equilibrium value that it is going to have for heaven. Okay, at equilibrium. So this delta T is actually not very large. Large when compared to one second. Okay, it's very, very small time. In, that, that, that time is actually infinity enough for us to actually calculate these quantities in general. Okay, unless you are looking at, if you are looking at temperature it is enough, but there are certain other quantities where this may not be enough. We talk about the data. But for, for, for quantities such as pressure, temperature, especially that of solids, such approximations are good enough. A few hundred picoseconds will give you a reasonable averaging of the uh, of the property that you are looking for. But that's not the case when you talk about viscous liquids and polymers and things like that. Because relaxation time for these uh, materials is much larger. We will talk about it when we come to it. But the, you get the whole idea as to why we are performing this time average. So, the two things have appeared here. One is the fact that we need to know what this A is as a function of momentum and the position. We need to know the explicit functional form. For example, if you are talking about pressure, how is pressure a function of the position and the velocity of all the atoms? We need to know that. Or if we need to know how the Gibbs free energy is a function of position and velocity of all the atoms. If you knew that, then we can take the average of it over time to calculate what its, uh, you know, what its value is going to be at equilibrium. Right. The second thing is, we need P of t and Q of t, which is basically the evolution, time evolution of the position and the momentum. Q is generally used for generalized position. Okay. How do we obtain this P of T and Q of T? By, by, uh, by solving Newton's equations. Theoretically, we can solve Newton's equations of motion to obtain P of T. Right. So, first we need this explicit functional form and that functional form is given by statistical mechanics and these evolution of p and q are is given by newton's equations newton's law by solving newton's equations so it's a good idea to actually look at how these uh, newton's equations of motion are written down okay and to illustrate a few additional concepts that are generally associated with solving these equations because they are not always easy to solve. Okay. They are easy to solve for certain simple, simple systems but for complicated systems like one atom connected to uh, 100,000 other atoms is not a very easy uh, problem to solve even if you look at simple Newtonian mechanics. Okay. So 
we have to introduce certain methodologies uh, that you will frequently see whenever you are working with the molecular dynamics in patients. Um, so we want to do that now. So first of all, before we solve the Newton's equations of motion, we need to be able to write down the equations of motion. Uh, we need to be able to write down the equations of motion. This is generally done in several different ways, each of which has its own advantage and disadvantage. I would like to illustrate these methods using a very simple example to show you that they all result in the same equation of motion. You may have looked at this before when you studied classical mechanics. Uh, nonetheless, I think it's a good uh, idea to have a recap of some of that. So I'm going to take a very simple problem. The problem is that of a block which is connected mass m, it's connected to a linear spring or spring constant k. Okay. This block is perturbed from its equilibrium position and left to awesome. Left to awesome. Okay. So how would you write down the equations of motion for this in general? What would be the first step? Free body diagram. You draw a free body diagram. Okay. And then if it's being pulled to the right, you would say that this is kx, right? This is mass m. So the equations of motion is, is nothing but mx double dot is equal to minus kx. So mx double dot plus kx is actually equal to 0 which will essentially, uh, which uh, is basically a second order differential equation. So given the value of x at t equal to 0 and the velocity at t equal to 0, you can basically predict and solve these differential equations and get x as a function of t and obviously the velocity also can be obtained as a function of t. Now, all our problems are not the same. For example, if you take take this problem okay where this is this is actually a double pendulum problem these lengths l1 and l2 are fixed right and uh, this is going to be my x1 and this is going to be my y1 and this is going to be my y2 and this is going to be my x2 right now, if you write down the equations of motion like the way we did for the previous problem, you have to do it. You have to draw the free body diagram of each body, okay, and then write down the equations of motion in the x direction, in the y direction for each of these two masses. In addition to that, see that the there is a constraint on x1 and y1, right? x1 square plus x y1 square, the whole root must be equal to L1, and all these things actually make the uh, make your derivation of the equations of motion very very messy okay. makes it very very complicated you can do it and see you know how to do this so you can do it and see how messy it gets and how hard it is to actually even write down the equations of motion correctly and then leave alone solving however there are alternative methodologies by which you can write down the equations of motion in a very simple manner there are two such methods one is called as the Lagrangian formulation and what is the other one? What is that? <laughs> Hermitian. Hamiltonian. Hamiltonian formulation. You have studied 
no these things can be these things are not these things are not you know i'm not i'm not trying to convince you that you know if you know these uh, whatever i have been talking for about 35 minutes you can uh, master uh, lagrangian formulation and hamiltonian formulation okay don't get me wrong these are probably courses by themselves okay to understand how you actually solve and write down these equations of motion yeah? it's, it's quite involved okay but you will get the essence of what uh these lagrangian formulation and hamiltonian formulation are actually doing and how easy it becomes for you to at least write down the equations of motion and in whenever you are solve whenever you are using molecular dynamics which is actually one of the main part of this course you have you are actually solving newton's equations of motion but first you know how you should know how to write them and for complicated systems you can't expect to write summation of fx, FX equal to ma Uh, mx double dot and some the sun the way it is done you have to use the grange formulation or hamiltonian formulation to actually even write down the equations of motion before solving okay so that's the reason why i think it's useful for us to know these formulations i'm just going to use the same block problem to show you that through the lagrangian formulation also we will get exactly this equation and through the hamiltonian formulation also we will get exactly the same equation just to illustrate that okay so in the lagrangian formulation so in the lagrangian formulation okay you write something called as the lagrangian which is the difference between the kinetic and the potential energy this is the first step this is the kinetic energy This is the potential. Okay. So the Lagrangian is written as a function of the uh, generalized momenta, or uh, or not momenta. So it's written as a function of the velocity, and the potential is a function of the position. I'll show you an example of this through the double pendulum to know what exactly these two dots and Q. They are called generalized. Q is basically generalized position. For example, in the um, uh, double pendulum problem, this and this are the generalized position. It is not necessary for us to know x one and y one. It is more than enough if we know what theta one is, right? If you know theta one as a function of time, you can find theta one dot, which is basically the velocity of this. Thing. You don't need to know x one and y one, right? But identifying the generalized coordinate itself can be complicated for some reason. Okay? But this system is actually quite simple. It's only theta one and theta two. Right? So you can write your cues, your cues for the double pendulum problem are theta one. And you got to okay. So once you know this Lagrangian, then you do the following. If you do this, you will get the equations of motion of any system. d by dt of do l by do q dot minus do l by do q is equal to zero will give you the equations of motion. So if there are many q's, if there is a qx, if there is, if there are many many q's, you do it for each one of them, and you will get the corresponding equations of motion for each direction, and so on and so forth. So for our block problem, for the block problem. What is L? Assuming that Q is same as X. Okay. What is L? Half m x dot square minus half k half k x square. Right. This is T and this is V. Correct. Now let's do let's perform these uh, operations here. What is do L by do Q dot 
what's d by dt of right and do l by do q is nothing but do l by do x which is nothing but minus k x right? so when i sub when i substitute this in the in this expression right here in this expression right here i get m x by the dot minus of minus k x is equal to 0 and this is exactly the same as what we got right and this is not the total energy this is actually something t minus v is basically called the lagrangian the difference between the kinetic and the potential energy it's not the total energy you need to remember that so this is another method by which you can actually get the equations of motion this is much more this this methodology becomes much more powerful and clear uh, when we actually try to solve the double pendulum problem. So I have a link here in my slides. Um, so you look at the double pendulum problem here. So this is from this particular website right here. Um, so theta 1 and theta 2 are the two degrees of freedom. Zoom it. Okay. Is that okay? Theta 1 and theta 2 are the two degrees of freedom right here. So I write down x1 okay, as L1 sine theta 1 and xy1 as L minus L1 sine cos theta 1. Okay, assuming that my x is in this direction and my positive y is pointing upwards. Okay, and same thing with x2 and y2. And now the potential energy of the system can be completely written in terms of theta 1 and theta 2. The kinetic energy also can be written completely in terms of theta 1 and theta 2 right it's very very simple and now write down t and v and then take the lagrangian t minus v which is completely in terms of theta 1 dot and theta 1 theta 2 now do exactly what we did d by dt of for theta 1 d by dt of do l by do theta 1 dot minus do l by do theta 1 would essentially give you the equation of motion this is the entire equation of motion right here this one the entire equation of motion for just theta 1 and this one would be the corresponding one for theta 2 so the number of steps that we actually had to write down there is just algebra here there is nothing much any, anything complicated in order to write down the equations forget about solving it that's a different ball game altogether but Writing down the equation of motion became very simple when we actually took this approach of writing down the Lagrange. And the Lagrange is actually a, it's not a vectorial quantity, it is actually a scalar quantity, it is a difference of two energies. Okay. From the um, scalar quantity, we are able to derive the uh, equations of motion that is governing the system. And this is actually the double pendulum which has been solved. And take a look at this website it's really nice so now the uh, lagrange's equations of motion are in terms of theta double dot and therefore they are two second order differential equations which have to be solved in order to see what how theta 1 and theta 2 are varying with time right they just theta 2 double dot is basically a second order equation so you have to just solve it okay so we won't go into the solution of these equations but i just want to illustrate what these things do and how easy it is to write down the equations of motion if you follow the lagrange uh, lagrange uh, if you follow the uh, writing the equations of motion through the lagrange's method now there's another one there's another methodology it's called as the hamiltonian framework okay in which the momenta and the positions are both recovered. The momentum of each particle and the position of each particle are treated separately. So these are the methodologies that you actually method. This is the methodology that you generally follow in order to construct what is referred to as the Hamilton. Once you know this, H 
you can actually write down the equations of motion so we will follow these procedures and uh, we will find out what the equations of motions are for the same block problem and see if it turns out to be the same thing as what we derived from the uh, from our general procedure okay so the first step is choose generalized coordinates so the generalized coordinates are is just x in our case but it can be theta for the double pendulum problem like i just showed you okay so first step The next step is construct Lagrangian as a function of q and q dot. So we know how to do that also, which is nothing but t minus v. So we say to construct the Lagrangian, which is of n x dot square minus x square. The next step is using Legendre transformation construct the Hamilton because the legendary transformation is qi dot pi minus l. So, is nothing but q dot q dot is nothing but x dot pi is nothing but the corresponding momentum minus L and this becomes what does this become what is this total energy of the system. Okay. For conservative systems, if you follow this procedure carefully, the Hamilton and the total energy of the system is the same. Okay. That is why I have written it down like this. But you can't always say that H is equal to the total energy of the system. You have to follow this procedure. You have to first write down what the generalized position is, then write down Lagrangian and perform a proper legendary transform like that to get the Hamilton. Okay. So once you know the Hamilton, once you know H, then the equations of motion are given by these. Q dot is equal to dou H by tau dou p so um, and p dot is equal to where in our problem q is nothing but x and p is nothing but Can you perform this differentiation to convince yourself that you get back mx double dot plus kx equal to 0? So, in this problem, so x q is nothing but x, so I am saying x dot is equal to dou h by dou p. Okay, so um, uh, dou h must be differentiated with respect to mx dot. So, what does that give you here? It gives you again x dot, if you will, right. So this is kind of in this case it is turning out to be trivial it just says x dot equal to x dot but it won't be the case for more complicated problems for example the double pendulum problem this is not going to be the case p dot is m x dot the whole dot is equal to m x double dot is equal to minus of dou h by dou q which is dou h by dou x in this case which is 4 times 
I am sure you guys are thinking, what is the point? In this simple problem, it does not appear to actually have contributed much. Always we were able to get mx double dot plus kx equal to zero, and uh, you know this seems to be a lot of work for this specific problem. But if you look at the double pendulum problem, that's not the case. Okay. You can take a look at it, and if you write down the um, Hamilton, you will get these as the Hamilton's equation right here. Theta one dot, theta two dot. P theta one dot, P theta two dot. For each theta one and theta two, there will be corresponding momenta associated with them also. And instead of getting second order differential equations, you get coupled first order differential equations, and you treat the positions and the momentum are treated kind of separate. And there are several other advantages which um, pan out by uh, if you are using the Hamilton's formulation in order to solve. Or write down and solve, write down the uh, differential equations. These things are not the focus of this class. I just want to emphasize that uh, whenever we are doing molecular dynamic simulations, we are essentially solving equations of motion. And when you are solving equations of motion, the first point of starting would be the appropriate Hamilton. Okay, you have to start with H, and after that only you have to derive the Probability equations of motion for that system. So, just to acquaint you with these uh, terminologies, Hamilton, Hamilton's equations of motion, Lagrange's equations of motion, and kind of highlight some of its uh, advantages over you know over the uh, regular way of doing it by drawing a free body diagram. We have we have these few uh, examples and discussions. If you want to learn more about this, you should take a course on classical mechanics. But that won't be necessary for any of the exams or um, anything that we, are, that we are about. Maybe some very simple problems which you should be able to solve without any without too much difficulty. Okay, so we can solve the equations of motion. We can write down the equations of motion if we follow the appropriate method. That's the uh, basic idea of this class. So, in uh, let me just introduce introduce this, and then we'll end this class. Okay. In molecular dynamic simulations, what we are doing is essentially solving the equations of motion. So, we are assuming a carton like this with all the atoms, and all of them are connected or interacting with each other. The spring should not uh, mislead you into thinking that every atom is only interacting with its nearest neighbor. Each atom could be interacting with something that's really far away. Okay, and you have to solve the equation of motion. But I've always been saying solve, solve. The two important things that are required for solving, I have not yet talked about. What is that? Initial positions and initial conditions. Okay. One thing for solid, I have already taught you how to. Initial positions. Right? You know how to construct the crystal structures. That is the initial position. Right? What would be the initial velocity? You need initial velocity for all these atoms, right? Otherwise, you cannot solve the equations of motion. So, from where would the initial velocity come? Temperature. Right? If you knew the temperature, then you can somehow assign initial velocities to all these atoms so that the temperature of a of the entire system is something, and that will help you solve the differential equations rather that is going to that is what lamps is going to do when it is solving the differential equation it is going to take some initial velocities some initial positions and boom it will start showing you these atoms oscillating over over, over, over you know over time as a function of time but but we still need one small thing you need to know how the property can actually be represented as a function of these positions and the momentum we still don't know that Right, we know only this. Um, we know how to evolve p and q as a function of time by solving the uh, Newton's equations. We still don't know how any thermodynamic property can be written as a function of p and q, and that is where the formalism of uh, statistical mechanics will come in. Okay. We'll talk about that in the subsequent classes. So, with that, I'd like to stop today's class. Yeah, one minute.